Well, good morning again. Let's begin with a prayer this morning. Our Father, we are grateful for life. We're grateful for health. We're grateful for the sacrifice that you made in giving us your son. Just ask that your presence will be here with us as we speak this morning. Give us the words that you want to want to us to say. We pray this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Um, just to give you a little background history, uh, Melody is a sixth generation Seventh-day Adventist. My great-great-grandmother joined the Advent faith during the Millerite movement and uh, went through the great disappointment. Well, I don't go quite that far back, but I'm fifth generation. That makes our grandkids, though, eighth. And do you remember the eight? Number eight is new beginnings. And we think that there are going to be some pretty new beginnings here very, very shortly. When we were raised, we heard very little about the holy days listed in Leviticus. And um, primarily because we all thought that they had been done away with at the cross. And I think probably most of you have had the same, similar experience at least. But what we want to do is to share with you kind of our journey. And um, Melody doesn't want me to tell the stories because we're short on time. So we'll, we'll narrow it down here a little bit. But suffice it to say that the first time that we ended up meeting with a group of people that were keeping God's calendar, his holy days. Um, we were not convinced, but we went home and for the next year, you know, once, once you have a possibility in mind, all of a sudden, some of the texts that you've just kind of slid over pop out at you. And it's like the light bulb turns on you and say, Hey, wait a minute. That has something important. And that's what happened to us. We kind of went from, well, you know, these are neat things and it's a good thing to spend extra time with God every year. Seeing the beauty of it, how neat is it every, every spring and every fall you get together with all your friends and you end up having all this rejoicing and, and the dancing and the music and the which they had back there. And that's what they did, part of it. And then the worship with it. And so we didn't see anything wrong with that. And um, then we went from there to seeing the prophetic significance. And all of a sudden that opens up a new, a, a new light. Because all of the feast days are prophetic, pointing forward to yet future events that have not happened, including Passover. All of them still have future fulfillments. When we saw that, that was we were like, wow, that that's incredible. Because Jesus said in Matthew 5, 17 and 18, that until it's fulfilled, nothing is abolished. And we saw that they all had future fulfillments. So that really expanded our horizon. What was the book, Melody, that we read? Written by one of the pioneers about the um, Crozier. Cro well, Crozier, but the, no, he didn't write the book. He wrote the article. The other book. There's there's a book that goes through and talks about all of the holy days, and then that they Haskell. are still Haskell. Shadow. Haskell, the the cross in its shadow. We read that book, and it's really interesting book. It was published by the church years ago, and I would encourage you to read the book. Because he goes through and, and talks about all every one of the holy days, and then he shows that every one of the holy days has a future fulfillment. That was really interesting. Well, if it has a future fulfillment, and I think we talked about this a little bit yesterday with um, Matthew five seventeen and 18. It says, one jot or one tittle shall not pass from the law until all be fulfilled. Well, if it has a future fulfillment, then it doesn't mean that it's Fulfilled. Fulfilled. And if it's not fulfilled, then it's not done away with. And if it's not done away with, it's important for us. 
So we, these things started dawning on us and um, it took us a year. And by the end of the year, we looked at each other and said, wow, these are actually part of God's moral law rather than the ceremonial law. Because there's only two laws, according to the way that Ellen White talks about it, only two laws, and, and one's ceremonial and one's immoral. Um, and so that was kind of, at the, like I say, at the end of that year, we looked at each other and said, boy, for us, this is something important. We need to do this. Not because we want to do it in order to be saved, but because we're saved and we want to come closer to our maker, we want to spend this extra time with him. And um, so, so that was kind of our journey in a nutshell. You want to add to that? Well, when I was a teenager, I came across Ellen White's uh, description of the feasts in um, Desire of Ages. And she um, wrote such glorious words about them, how, you know, all of Israel, whoever was able, they all came together and um, and she just the the way she described it was just used such glorious language, and I thought, oh, I was so envious that they got this whole week, spring and fall, to come together and study the word together, and uh, praise God together, and renew acquaintances, and and she describes all the things that the feast did for them, for their spiritual life, and I thought. You know, I don't, I don't understand why God abolished these days, but since I was taught they were, I accepted that. But I was envious. I thought, oh, I wish I could have been back there and joined in this wonderful celebration, spring and fall. And um, so that seed was planted in my mind. And so when we met this group of um, peacekeepers, I thought, well, I, I don't see anything wrong with getting together to study, you know, the Word for a whole week, every spring and fall. And they invited us to be speakers at their meeting, knowing that we weren't peacekeepers. And um, at the end of the week, one of them handed me a booklet showing that Paul kept the feasts after the cross and taught his Gentile converts to do the same. And so I read through it. I said to Richard, there is something here. We need to study. And so we did for an entire year before we accepted it. Let's begin back clear at creation time. You know, one of the things that we've been told is that these days were instituted at Sinai. Have you heard that? Okay. In Genesis 1.14, it says, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Well, were there seasons, summer, winter, spring and fall at creation? No. And so that word seasons was out of place. We looked it up and it actually is the word moed, which means appointed times or festivals. Now, interestingly, my Catholic Bible, that is the, um, the Jerusalem Bible, calls these festivals. It says, and for festivals, it translates it correctly, which was a surprise to me that, that the Catholic Bible would actually have a correct translation on that or more accurate. So that's kind of one of the places that it begins. If if the if the moon, well, and and we need to look this up. It's um, Psalm one hundred and four, verse nineteen. So, in other words, God is saying here in Genesis one that He created the um, the uh, heavenly bodies to so that we know when the festivals began. This was in the Garden of Eden before Adam and Eve sinned. That was very significant. That really sunk into our brains. Okay, Psalm 104.19. It's 
says, he appointed the moon for seasons. The sun north is going down. And you look up the word seasons, and it's Moed, which means, again, appointed times. And then another check. Indeed, does God base uh, the timing of his festivals on the moon? And you go to Leviticus 23, and it says it does. It goes according to the moon. On the 14th day of the first month is Passover. And the word month is really the Hebrew word moon. And so the 14th day after the new moon is Passover. And it goes through each festival and shows how what part, day of the month based on the moon that it is to be celebrated. Now I'm going to throw something in here that we just learned recently. Um, how many of you have read the book Jasher? Anybody here? Okay, I see a couple hands, two or three hands. Jasher is mentioned in the Bible two or three times, I think it is. Twice. Twice, okay? It's, been, it's mentioned in, so it was an ancient, ancient book that was recognized by the Bible writers. So this would have been long before Jesus was born. Here. According to the book of Jasher, Abraham celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles. Any of you heard that before? It's really interesting. And Abraham lived with Shem and Noah from the age of 10 to 50. Now, I knew that Noah and Abraham had lived at the same time. I think according to the biblical chronology, Abraham was about 75 years old or so when Noah died. So Noah and Shem taught Abraham directly for 40 years. This is, again, according to the book of Jasher. And Abraham kept the Feast of Tabernacles. So there's some really interesting, interesting history when you start looking into it and seeing what, what there is. So um, I'd like to just go to Leviticus chapter 23. And we talked about some of this last night. And I just would like to uh, repeat some of this so that we have it on, on the video. In the, ten, in the uh, fourth commandment, which talks about the Sabbath, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. No place in there does it say the year to congregate or come together to worship or to assemble. It doesn't say it there. It doesn't. So if you just simply go by that, you're going to end up keeping the Sabbath a very different way than what we, what we traditionally do. You have to go to Leviticus chapter 23 to find out that there is a command to come together and to congregate and to worship together as a group. So let's look at this. Leviticus 23, chapter, chapter 23, verses 1, 2. Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them concerning the feasts of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. He says it twice. He's trying to make a point. He says the feasts of the Lord, and then says these are my feasts. So he's saying it twice. These are not the Jewish feasts. These are God's appointment times that he has set out to meet with his people. Then you look at the very next verse, verse 3. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of rest, a holy convocation. He calls it a holy convocation. You shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. So he says, these are my feasts. And then he lists the seventh day Sabbath as the first day or the first feast. So if you keep the Sabbath, you are a feast keeper. Conversely, if you keep Sunday, you are also a feast keeper. Have you ever thought about that? Do you know the Catholic Church calls their holy days feasts? They do. And they acknowledge that they acknowledge that their feast days are their substitution for the Jewish feast days. They say, we are the ones that abolished it. And I, I have the letter. I'll 
I can read to you later. Um, yeah, so they they outright admit that admit this. All right, verse four. So verse three starts out. This is the this is the Sabbath, and um, you're to you're to work six days, and the seventh day is the Sabbath. So we set this cycle into motion, and this is a convocation, and you're not to do any work. So verse four says, "These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which you shall proclaim in their seasons." So he has set the weekly cycle in to affect with the Sabbath being where you're to come together, convocate. And then he says, oh, and by the way, here are the annual times that you're going to come in. And that word seasons, again, proclaim in their seasons, it's the same word found in Genesis 1.14, Moad. So God has set up his calendar and he said, hey, get together with me every week and then Get together with me in your season. Now, you think about it. This is um, Passover time. We're to get together with him every Passover, and Passover comes in the spring every year. It's in its season. Now, as we go on through, and we're not, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here because you can go through and do this yourself. The rest of the chapter lists out all of the holy days. And he will say, um, well, look at, look at verse 7. He's talking about the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He says, in the first day you shall have a holy convocation. The exact same wording that he says for the seventh-day Sabbath earlier. You shall do no servile work therein. And the servile work means just your, your ordinary work. But it says basically the same thing. You're, you're not, this is a Sabbath, and you are to have a holy convocation, and you're not to do any work. Verse 8 lists it out too. But you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days, and the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein. Same thing. Go on through here, and it actually ends up calling these days Sabbaths on, on further in. Yes, in verse 24, it uh, calls the Feast of Trumpets a Sabbath. And then in verse 32, it calls the Day of Atonement a Sabbath. And then in verse 39, it calls the first and last days of Tabernacles Sabbath by the word Sabbath. So the Bible is uh, God is saying using the same terminology for the yearly Sabbaths as he does the weekly. He calls them all by the name of Sabbaths. He says these are all worship days, days to worship him, God on. We're to have a holy convocation on these days. We're to do no work on these days. Um, the, all the same thing as the seventh-day Sabbath. So God is tying them all together, calling them by the same name, telling us to do the same things on these days as we do on the seventh-day Sabbath. Now, one of the things that we ran into is that there are sacrifices that are given on these days. And that's been one of the big excuses. People say, well, there's sacrifices on there. So when, when, when um, the Bible says that the sacrifices are no longer needed at Yeshua's death, that these days go away with it. Because well, they say that... The feast days and the sacrifices are, are married together. You can't separate them. Therefore, when the sacrificial system ended, the feast days ended. That's the logic. Okay. So let's look take at a look numbers, at that. Numbers chapter 28. This is, this is really interesting. And this gets in, into some of the arguments that the evangelicals use to destroy the Seventh-day Sabbath. So you folks need to understand what's going on here. So Numbers chapter 28. Um, you can read through there, and I encourage you to do it on your own. And you'll see that each one of these um, days has offerings attached to it. But what's really important here, from our point of view, is that verse 9, 
And you take a look at this. It says, on the seventh day, two lambs of the first year without spot and two tenths deals of flour for a meal offering mingled with the oil and the drink offering thereof. This is the burnt offering of every Sabbath beside the continual burnt offering and his drink offerings. So every day they had a morning and an evening sacrifice. Of one lamb. Of one lamb. Okay, back at verse 4. But on the seventh day Sabbath, they had twice as many. They sacrificed twice as many lambs as the rest of the week. So there, so there is a sacrifice directly tied to the seventh day Sabbath. So, so if what? you use the logic that the sacrifice does away with the worship day, you will do away the with the seventh day Sabbath. And the evangelicals bring this out. And they say Seventh-day Adventists are inconsistent here because they do away with the yearly Sabbath, but they keep the Seventh-day Sabbath. And um, they point out that sacrifices are done on all those days. And, of course, their point is that they're all abolished, including the Seventh-day Sabbath. So the very arguments that the evangelicals use against the Seventh-day Sabbath, Seventh-day Adventists use against the feast days. And identical, it's same text. Inconsistent. Yeah. And so if you if you use those arguments that the evangelicals use against the feast days, you're also going to do away with the seventh day Sabbath. And we believe that at the beginning of the time of trouble, well, in fact, in Great Controversy, it says that as the storm approached, approaches, uh, this is in the chapter on the pending conflict, meaning just before the time of trouble. As the storm approaches, the majority in the world will, in the church, will join with the world. That means the majority in the Seventh day Adventist church are going to become Sunday keepers, which is incomprehensible right at the beginning of the time of trouble. When the Sunday law is coming on, they're all going to abandon the faith. And, and become Sunday keepers. Well, and not all. There's there's still a remnant. Well, Just don't yes, forget that. The majority. Yeah. The majority. Page six oh eight in Great and, Controversy. Um, okay. So why do they do that? The only thing I can figure is that the I believe the evangelicals are going to be bringing out all these things we're teaching you today, showing the Seventh Day Adventists are inconsistent in their logic, and so the majority of Seventh Day Adventists are going to see this and are going to say, "Oh," and. Um, and so they have a choice. They're either going to have to join with the, do away with all of the, the Sabbaths yearly and weekly or embrace them all. You can't separate them. And so they've already rejected seven yearly Sabbaths. So all I have to do is convert over to one and reject the seventh-day Sabbath. And I believe that's what they're going to do when they see this. When the evangelicals, there's a lot of deep students out there in the evangelical world. They're no, they're no dummies. They're uh, slouches in the Word of God. And they're going to bring this out. And um, so it's a lot of seventh-day Adventists are going to say, wow, we've been duped and they're going to join especially when their lives are on the line. I know some of you are raising your hands. If we take questions, we're not going to get through. Yeah, we don't have time for we don't, questions. We're not Sorry. going to get through. Yeah. So here's what's happened here with our Adventist church. We've said the seventh day stays, but we separate the sacrifices off and they're gone. And I believe that's true. But then... That's where they end. Then the excuse is, we don't keep these other days because they have sacrifices on them. Well, again, you have to be consistent, one way or, or the other. Since I alluded to it, I'd like to really quickly read this letter written by a uh, Catholic Church bishop. And it's a letter that the first part of it um, we've heard over and over read in our evangelistic meetings, but they, they stop in the middle of the letter. They don't read the entire letter. It's an, it's an amazing admission. It was written in, um, let me see, it was 1912, yes. And uh, here's the entire letter. I'm going to read the whole thing to you, written by Catholic Bishop Enright. Dear friend, I have offered and still offer $1,000 to anyone who can prove to me from the Bible alone that I am bound under grievous sin to keep Sunday holy. It was the Catholic Church which made the law obliging us to keep Sunday holy. 
The church made this law long after the Bible was written. Hence, said law is not in the Bible. Christ our Lord empowered his church to make laws binding in conscience. He said to his apostles and their lawful successors in the priesthood, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be binding in heaven. The Catholic Church abolished not only the Sabbath, but all the other Jewish festivals. Pray and study. I shall be always glad to help you as long as you honestly seek the truth. Respectfully, T and write CSSR. So that's an amazing admission. He's saying that uh, the change of these Sabbaths is not in the Bible. The Catholic Church changed them to their own festivals because they believe that God empowered them to make those changes. So unless you're a Catholic, um, if you if you go along with what they said, that they are the ones that abolished the Sabbath and the uh, yearly festivals, um, if you go along with that, you are acknowledging the Catholic Church is correct, that they have the power to change God's worship days. And so we delved into history, and we found out in church history that the early Christians kept the festivals until the Catholic Church abolished them. And in fact, in some remote areas like Scotland, they kept them until the 11th century, until the Catholic Church finally got there and, and stopped it. My understanding is that... Um... Oh, now I can't think. Who Who is the saint that Patrick. has... Pa saint Patrick actually kept the festivals. Yes, he, and he the kept the Seventh-day Sabbath and the festivals. Yet the Catholic Church calls him a saint in their church, but he was a Sabbath keeper and a festival keeper. That's very interesting history. Yeah. Okay. I just want to talk a little bit about um, Ezekiel chapter 20. And this is a a verse that um, Adventists use, and um, yeah, okay, Ezekiel 20, verse 12, moreover also I gave them my Sabbaths, plural, to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. Now, if we're talking about the seventh day Sabbath, it would have been singular. It, it, would gave, it would be reading, and I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign. Well, um, we, we had an excellent talk yesterday talking about this word oath, which is sign. And this is, is where it also appears. Now, there are several times, um, verse 13, uh, Starting in the, about the second, the second line there, they walked not in my statutes, and they despised my judgments. With if a, if a man do, he shall even live in them. And my Sabbath, they greatly polluted. It's clearly talking about more than one. Well, again, in verse 20, it says, And hallow my Sabbath, plural, and they shall be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. So God is saying that all of his Sabbaths, weekly and yearly, are included in his special sign or seal. If we want to further absolute proof, Exodus. go to Exodus chapter 13, and it makes it even more clear. Exodus 13, beginning with verse 7. Yeah, statute is simply means a law. And... Um, so, yeah, that's important. All and right. Yes, the, the feasts in Leviticus 20, 30, 23 are called statutes. And over and over in Leviticus 23, it says to keep them forever throughout your generations. They're, they're, it's interesting. God repeats it. Keep it forever. Here in uh, Leviticus 13, 7, or Exodus, I'm sorry, 13, 7, unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days. So this is the, the topic here. And then verse 9, I'm just skipping down to verse 9, but you can look through and see that the topic is unleavened bread, which is what we're in right now. And it, verse 9, unleavened bread, shall be a for a sign unto thee upon thine hand. And that sign is the very same word that is used in 
Ezekiel chapter 20 that we were just talking about. It's a sign upon thy hand and for memorial between thine eyes that the Lord's law may be in thy mouth for with a strong hand hath the Lord brought thee out of Egypt. Now, we've seen that the mark of the beast is going to be placed where? In the hand and in the forehead. That's the mark of the beast is Satan's, Satan's counterfeit right. for God's seal. And we see here that God is going to put it in the hand and between the eyes, which is the forehead. Also, and it's and it's the oath, the sign. So this ends up being exceedingly important. This ends up taking it away from being ceremonial and puts it into moral. And God's moral law doesn't change. Because the last generation are the only ones to be sealed while they're still alive. And, then, and we definitely want God's seal. Then look at verse 10. Thou shalt therefore keep this ordinance in his season, his appointed time, from year to year. Again, the appointed time being Moed. So to keep it from year to year. So what we're seeing is from, from early, early on here, God ended up setting the, the uh, moon for seasons, for Moeds, or again, festivals. festivals, his appointment times. It's his calendar that he set up there. And then he's listed out specifically when they're to be kept. Leviticus 23 tells you on the on the 14th day of the first month, you're to do this. And on the 15th day begins this and, and so on. It just lists it out clearly. Because of how we're designed, yes. Okay. So, so now we want to show you from the Old Testament that these festivals are crucial for the last generation because they are part of Armageddon. And that's was when we hit this, we were really startled. Stunned. We were stunned. This is um, Isaiah 14, beginning with verse 12. It says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? And by the way, some of the modern translations end up saying, um, instead of saying Lucifer, son of the morning, they say the bright and morning star. And then one, my New American Standard Bible, re references it to Jesus in Revelation. So there's a huge thing that's going on here that the devil is wanting us to not understand. And I think you'll see here in a minute why. So it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine hand, thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Well, where's God's throne? It's in the north. Um, who comes from the north every year to give presents to everybody that has been good. You start to see, do you, do you start to see some parallels here? All right. Well, you change, you change around two letters in the word Santa and you come up with the word Satan. It's pretty stunning. Okay. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation. If you look that word congregation up, it's Moed, which means appointment times or the holy days. In other words, He's going to, to, to sit on God's holy days and substitute his own. So Satan was saying he's going to take charge of the holy days. He's going to substitute his own holy days because Satan knows the power of worship. Who you worship, you become like. So Satan was saying, I'm going to set up my own festivals in opposition to God's festivals, and I'm going to rule over the festival world and get the whole universe worshiping me instead of God. And I'm going to take over the universe in this manner. That's, that's what his plan was, because he knew the power of worship days. And did Satan do that? Now, here's a, here's a check. We find out, did Satan do that? He did indeed. Instead of um, Day of Atonement, we've got Valentine's Day instead of um, instead of tabernacles, we have Christmas. Instead of Passover, we have Easter. And we go on and on and on. 
And uh, the devil also, he wanted to completely change God's calendar, so we don't even know how to calculate the timing of his festivals. So instead of beginning the new year in the spring like God does, he begins the new year in the middle of the winter. Instead of beginning the day at sunset like God does, he begins the day at midnight. It makes it for confusion because like whenever I teach new people, I tell them, okay, Passover is on this day, but remember it begins the evening before at sunset. You have to explain all that um, so they understand. So um, Satan just really did his best to upset God's calendar. Why? He had a definite motive. Satan doesn't do anything unless he has a good reason. He doesn't put a lot of effort into things that are for no good reason. So Satan was trying to destroy God's calendar so we wouldn't know how to calculate the feast days. That's what he was doing. Interestingly, this um, word congregation or moed is actually repeated in um, Revelation. Revelation. I think it's 1616. Armageddon is the only listed, named one time. And if you go to the SDA commentary, Bible commentary, and we found this stunning, it says that uh, it's made up, Armageddon's made up of two words, Har and Megiddo, which comes from Moad. Har is mountain. And, and Moed is... Feast days. Feast days, or appointment times. So and it means then mountain in, of the feast days. That's what Armageddon yeah. means, mountain of the feast days. So the, it goes ahead, the, AB, the uh, a Bible commentary goes ahead and says that it, it references Isaiah 14, verse 13, in the Mount of the Congregation. Because it's the same wording, mountain of the feast days. So... Armageddon is going to be all about worship, who you worship, when you worship. Now, I believe there's probably going to be a literal battle out there as well. It, it's going to carry on. But the important thing is the worship. And so we see here Lucifer is setting his, his feast days ahead of God's. And this is before the world's created. So this is way, way, way back when. And then we we find it being the same issue at the very end time. Right, same yeah. issue at the end time as that, that started Satan's rebellion. Nothing has changed. And so the issue, Armageddon, is over whose face days are you going to keep, God's or Satan's? That's what it boils down to. And And if it makes you feel better, eliminate the word feast days and put in appointment times. Whose appointments are you going to keep? Are you going to keep God's appointments or are you going to keep the devil's appointments? It really comes down to that. Because it's one the, or the other. The word moed can be translated as appointment times. And so we prefer that wording, appointment times, because they are appointment times on God's calendar. Okay. Are we ready to go to the New Testament? Did, was there anything yes. else you wanted added? Now, okay. Now we're going to show you um, from the New Testament that Paul kept the feast days and taught them to his Gentile converts to the end of his ministry, and he never changed. Now, the Seventh-day Adventist Church admits that at the beginning of Paul's ministry, he did keep the feast days, and um, but they, he, they, they said that he abandoned it later on in his uh, ministry because he, real, he, he had a hard time just discarding his Jewishness. It took him a while, but he finally got there. By the end of his ministry, he was no longer keeping the feast days. That's what the Assembly of his church teaches. So we're going to examine this and find out, is that correct or not? I submit to you, Paul never changed. At the very end of his ministry, he was still keeping the feast days, and he taught them to his Gentile converts to keep them as well, and we will show that to you. Now, we need to understand that Paul was the number one student of the number one teacher who is Gamaliel in all of Israel. And in order to get into Gamaliel's class by the age of, I think, 13, you had to have memorized the whole Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. Can you imagine? You could not be a slouch scholastically to get into Gamaliel's um, class. We were told this by a rabbi. Yeah. So Paul 
what Paul says, I think we need to take seriously because remember he ended up spending three years with our Messiah? After he was converted, After he spent converted. three years out in Arabia. And Ellen White says that during those three years that Jesus communed with him and taught him everything that he later preached. And so um, he, Paul, when he um, was converted, uh, we're told in Acts of the Apostles, during those rumors, he went, went blind for several days and Ananias was instructed to go and restore his eyesight to him. And during those three days of darkness, Paul had three days to think. And since he was a, such an incredible student of the Torah and had the whole Torah memorized, I'm sure all those verses were running through his mind. Well, you and know the Spirit was bringing it to Ellen White yeah. tells us that during that time, the Holy Spirit showed him the real meaning of those verses in the Torah that he had misunderstood. And he saw the entire, it's like the scales fell off his spiritual eyes. He saw everything in a completely new light. Let's take a look at Galatians chapter 1. Old truth, new light. That's correct. Um, this, is, this is rather amazing. How many people are going to be able to say what Paul says in these verses? Galatians chapter 1, beginning with verse 11. It says, but I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. Remember, he's graduated from Gamaliel's school. He's one of the top in the whole land of Israel. And he says, the gospel which was preached to me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then you go on down here, it says, um, Verse 17, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again after Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him. 15 Here's days. Here's what Ellen White says about that. She says, sketches from the life of Paul, page 191, she writes, he, Paul, then shows them that after his conversion, he had no opportunity to receive instruction from man. The doctrines which he preached had been revealed to him by the Lord Jesus Christ. After the vision at Damascus, Paul retired into Arabia for communion, communion with God. Then in Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, March 30, 1911, she writes, During his sojourn in Arabia, he emptied his soul of the prejudices and traditions that had shaped his life and received instruction from the source of truth. Jesus communed with him and established him in his faith, bestowing upon him a rich measure of divine wisdom and grace. So Jesus himself taught Paul for three years while he was out there in the desert of Arabia and established him in the faith, which he later preached in his entire ministry for 40 years. So we're going to find that Paul kept the feast. But if Paul was wrong in keeping those days, then you have two, two possibilities. Either Paul was a lousy student or his teacher was a lousy teacher. I mean, isn't that about, about the case here? You know, Paul couldn't get over his Jewishness. He couldn't, he, he, it took him all this time to get over. Well, then either Paul didn't learn from our Messiah, or our Messiah couldn't teach him. And I don't believe that either one of those is right. Right. So let's go to Philippians chapter 4. Now, verse 8 is the one that says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, and so forth. Look at verse 9. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Why could Paul say that? He got it directly from the Messiah, directly. So do what I do. So let's see what Paul did. Yeah. Okay, there's a couple of places. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 5. First Corinthians five. Whoops, I'm second Corinthians. 
First Corinthians 5, verse 7 and 8. But let's start with verse 6. This is Paul talking to the Corinthians. Now, Corinthians, by the way, is not a suburb of Jerusalem. It's not, it, he's dealing with a bunch of heathen converts, and he's teaching them. And he's teaching them what these holy days mean. So it says, verse 6, Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as, in, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. So he's teaching him the meaning. We want to get the leaven out. We want to get the sin out of our lives. So, verse 8, Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And if you look up that word to keep the feast, it actually means to observe a festival or a holy day. So he's telling them, let's keep this day, but this is the reason we're keeping it, is to show that we're getting the leaven and the, and the um, sin out of our lives. See, Paul was teaching them to keep Passover and, and the week on, uh, of an unleavened bread here, and he did not want them to degenerate into the formalism of the Jews who had lost sight of the meaning of their feast days. And they were just keeping them with no meaning. And it's useless to keep holy days without understanding their meaning. So he wanted to make sure his congress did not degenerate into the formalism of the Jews. He was teaching them the meaning of these feast days and telling them to keep them. All right. Um, let's go to Acts chapter 19, 18 actually, Ch uh, Acts chapter 18. And we'll begin with verse 19, and I believe this was his last Yes, this verse trip. is about Paul's final leg of his final missionary journey at the end of 40 years of preaching. So we'll see what he's doing here. Beginning with verse 19. Okay, Acts 18, verse 19. And he came to Ephesus. Again, this is not a suburb of Jerusalem. And left them there. But he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they desired him to tarry longer time with them, he consented not, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem, but I will return again unto you, if God will, and he sailed from Ephesus. Do any of you have a um, an NIV or some other translation here? Does anybody have it? I I would like I would like you to read Verse 21 in there. Here. Take it. Acts, what? Acts 19. Acts 18. I'm sorry. Acts 18. Verse 21. As he reads it, see what it drops out. It's very interesting what the NIV drops out of this verse. It says, but as he left, he promised, I will come back if it is God's will. Then he set sail from Ephesus. You see what, what, what happened to that? The feasts if, were totally taken out. If you don't want people to know about the holy days and that Paul himself was keeping them, cancel culture. just cancel it. The cancel culture done a long, long time ago. It's, it's, it's really interesting looking and seeing what has happened here. So... Um, if you look up the word keep, it's Strong's 4160. It means to fulfill, to observe, or to perform. Now, we have been told that Paul knew that all these Jews were coming to Jerusalem and that he wanted to do missionary work there, and so that's why he showed up. Well, I'm sure he did want to talk with them, and he did want to do the missionary work. But when he says to keep this feast, it actually means to fulfill, to observe or to perform it. He was going there to keep it himself. So yes, Paul doesn't doesn't use the reasoning that he was going there to be a missionary. He's going there to himself keep the feast. It say it. Yes, it does not say attend. It says he's going to keep it or observe it. All right, let's go to Acts chapter 20. 
you know, it helps to have more than one verse backing it up so that it's not just a, just a, a mistake. The Bible talks about having two or three witnesses. Well, we've already seen the witness in Corinthians. We now have seen the witness in Ephesus. Now let's take a look at Philippi. This is Acts chapter 20. And um, you have that ready? Yes. Okay. Interestingly, Ellen White really expounds on this, says more than what is said here. But let's read this. Verse 6. And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came unto them to Troas in five days where we abode seven days. All right? So here's Ellen White's comments on this text. At Philippi, Paul tarried to keep the Passover. Only Luke remained with him, the other members of the company passing on to Troas to await him there. The Philippians were the most loving and true-hearted of the apostles' converts, and during the eight days of the feast, he enjoyed peaceful and happy communion with them. So Passover and unleavened bread are back to back, and together they constitute eight days. So she's saying he's keeping the whole feast of Passover and unleavened bread, just like we're doing this week, with his Philippians con converts. And um, yeah, that's Acts of the Apostles, pages 390 to 91. Um, now, I heard one preacher who said about this, well, Philippi, because we maintain that Philippi, he was with his Gentile converts, which is what Ellen White affirms here, his, his Gentile converts. But um, one preacher said, well, at Philippi, wherever Paul went, he always joined with the local Jewish synagogue to worship. And so Paul would have just joined with the local Jewish synagogue to keep his... Um, Jewish feast days because it was his national holiday because he was a Jew. So if you're a Jew, sure, you can keep the feast days because they're the national holiday of that country. But if you're not a Jew, they're not applicable to you. That was the idea. So Paul's only keeping these days because it was his national holiday. And he was not, and he was keeping at the local synagogue, not with his Gentile converts. That's what this preacher was saying. Well, the um, Philippi did not have a synagogue. And how do we know that? Because in Acts, it says that when Paul went to Philippi, he met with the women by the river. He met with several women by the river. Now, why did Paul do that? It takes a quorum of 10 men to form a synagogue. So obviously, they didn't have 10 men. And it says that he met with the women by the, by the river. So there was no synagogue in Philippi. So 10 men, and it's called a minion. They had to have 10 men to have a minion, and then they could have a synagogue. Now, interestingly, remember when Abraham was, was negotiating with God over Sodom and Gomorrah? He brought it down, 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 down to finally 10. It's the same thing. Are there 10 righteous people there? So, um, so, um, so yes, Paul, Paul would have been keeping the Passover and unleavened bread with his Gentile converts. And this was, again, the final leg of his final missionary journey before he was captured in Jerusalem at the end of his 40 years of ministry. Okay. Let's look up something else. It's been said to us that uh, you can only keep the feasts in Jerusalem. Okay? So therefore, since there's no temple, we can't keep it, right? Well, yeah, you're, you're pointing this out, Dean, saying that we are the temple. But th that's kind of jumping ahead there just a little bit. Well, notice that Paul kept the feast here with his Gentile commerce away from the temple in Jerusalem. So by Paul's own actions, he is keeping them, but he's keeping them not in the suburbs of Jerusalem, but way out away. But so, he was following Jesus' following words. Jesus words. Do you remember the story with the woman at the well? This is John chapter 4. And... Um,
beginning with verse 19, and let's look at this. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and this is on Gerizim. And uh, she was from what nationality? Samaritan. She's a Samaritan. And there was a big argument between the Samaritans and the Jews. Do we keep these festivals in Jerusalem? Or the Samaritans said, well, we'll keep them up here on Gerizim. The, um, uh, the only time the Jews went to the temple in Jerusalem to worship was at the festivals. The rest of the year, they kept the Seventh-day Sabbath at their local synagogue in their local town. So the issue here in John 4 is where are you going to keep the, the yearly festivals? On um, That's what the woman at the well was bringing up. She was a Samaritan. There was a big, the, the Samaritans had built a rival temple on Mount Gerizim, and they worshiped there instead of the temple in Jerusalem. So there was this bitter animosity between the Samaritans and the Jews over where do you go to worship um, for the yearly festivals? So again, verse 20, our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Lord or worship the Father. Ye worship, you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. Pretty clear. He's saying, time's coming, and now is. It's, it's not going to be here. It's not going to be in Jerusalem. It's where you are. And then Paul, who was taught by Yeshua for three years, ends up worshiping in, in Philippi, he worships in Eph Ephesus, he's in Corinth, and uh, so by his very example, he's, he's, he's worshiping in spirit and truth. So um, anyway, there's to us, Mel well, first off, Melody, is there anything else that we want to add in into here right now? Okay, go ahead. Uh, yes, I want to bring out really quickly, showing how the feasts are all oh, yes. show a different aspect of the gospel. Yes. We're hit over and over with, um, well, the important thing right now is the three angels' messages and your feast day messages detracting away from the three angels' messages. And um, so, therefore, it's a false gospel taking away from what we need to be focusing on right now. Um, well, the feast days are at the are the heart of, the gospel is at the heart of the feast days. They're, they're intertwined. Each feast day portrays a different aspect of the gospel. And when you understand the meaning of each feast day, then you get the whole gospel. Uh, when I was growing up, the Seventh-day Adventist Church emphasized um, sanctification over justification. In other words, it was... No, when I was growing up, it was sanctification over justification. They were emphasizing works over um, the, yeah. And so I grew up in a legalistic religion, which really threw me for a loop. For when I was growing up, I remember thinking, I can never be saved. I can never be good enough. Um, in fact, one, one famous Adventist preacher, Martin Weber, wrote a book, I think, or maybe it was some other, and it, it was entitled Never Good Enough, addressing this, that so many Adventists felt they would never be good enough. And that's the way I felt because of this overemphasis on sanctification and not justification. Now they flipped the other extreme. It's they're emphasizing justification to the exclusion of sanctification. In fact, that's the message of um, Ezekiel 8, which we'll be covering tonight, showing that they're going to delve into that. Well, I submit to you that one emphasizing one to the exclusion of the other gives you a false balance of the gospel. And uh, it's not the truth. You have to have both together um, to come up with the truth. And um, so if the church had always followed the feast days and known their meaning, they would never have gotten off into these false overemphasis one or the other and would have had kept a, they would stay, you know, in the straight and narrow road instead of delving off to the right or to the left, like the Bible says, don't fall off to the right or don't fall off to the left. 
And, um, and a lot of our generation left the church because of that um, legalistic legalism. That was really sad when we, when Richard went to our class reunion recently, a lot of our classmates have left the faith. Last week. Yeah. Our and, 50th. Um, yeah. So, and, and some of them refused to even come. For Sabbath morning. For Sabbath because of it's a religious thing yeah. or whatever. And we'll we'll meet with you at the bar in Meridian Saturday after night. Saturday night. And you know, it's just it was very very sad. So it's very much. So um so anyway, really quickly, Passover represents justification. It represents Jesus dying for us on the cross. When he dies for us on the cross, we come to the foot of the cross, we repent of our sins and ask for forgiveness. That's what that was in the same. It's all tied into the sanctuary. Out in the courtyard of the sanctuary, that represents the cross that where that the lamb was sacrificed on the altar. And that represents justification. So there the sinner would come and s sacrifice the lamb and um, confess his sins. That's justification. And then after that, you come to the laver. Well, that was um, where the priests washed before going into the sanctuary. That represents baptism. So as soon as we come to Jesus, we get baptized. And then you go into the first apartment of the sanctuary, and there you have the table of showbread, which represents Jesus, the bread of life, and also represents the Bible as the, um, the word is also the bread of life. And you have the um, candlestick, which represents Jesus, the light of the world, and interestingly, in the candlestick is the oil, representing the Holy Spirit. Notice they're all one, one piece of furniture, right? So Jesus That's is right. the Holy Spirit. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, then it has the altar of incense, which represents prayer as, a, as the incense rose up above the curtain over to the holy place where the um, Ark of the Covenant was, which represents the throne of God. Um, that represents prayer. So the holy place is sanctification. Through Bible study, prayer, and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, we grow. Yeah, we grow in obedience and our ability to follow the word. Which feast is that? And that's the Point Feast of out. Unleavened Bread, yep. what we're keeping right now. It's um, getting sin out of our life and growing in our ability to walk, become like Jesus. And then the next feast is Pentecost. At Pentecost is when the early rain was poured out. And uh, we notice when you, when you establish a pattern, God has established a pattern here. If the early rain was poured out on Pentecost, we believe the latter rain will begin to pour, be poured out on Pentecost. So Pentecost is all about pouring out of the um, God's rain of his word. Now, um, don't have time to delve into it, but in Deuteronomy, there's a, um, well, you see, in Deuteronomy, there's a text that's, that, um, I think it's Deuteronomy 32, um, a very interesting text. Um, Oh, you want to read it? Okay. Deuteronomy 32, verse 2. My doctrine shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew, as a small rain upon the tender herb and as the showers upon the grass, because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe you greatness unto our God. So the early and latter rain is really a greater outpouring of understanding of God's word, is what it is. And um, so... Um, that's why, you know, Ellen White has a very interesting comment. She says that in the, when the latter rain is being poured out, there's, it can be poured out all around you and you can miss it. And that quote bothered me a great deal for a very long time. I thought, how could that be possible that you can miss the latter rain and be poured out all around you and you miss it? Because I always thought the latter rain was like people being raised from the dead and and all these wonderful miracles, and um, that's why I thought it was. But now when I understand it, it's a deeper uh, knowledge of God's Word being poured out, now I see how it can be 
yeah. happening all around you and you miss it unless you too are delving deeply into God's word. And um, well, so there, that's will what, be, there will be miracles that are yes, accompanying the latter rain, just like it did the early rain. Right. Too. But interestingly, the word um, the word yara in Hebrew is the word for rain, and it comes directly from the word Torah. Isn't that interesting? You can look it up in a Strong's Concordance. Yara and Torah are intricately related. So I believe that the latter rain is a greater outpouring of an understanding of God's Torah, which is his law. And um, so that's what we have to look forward to. And Pentecost could be shown still in the holy place. Because that's where the spirit, the, the oil, is. So in the sanctuary, that's where that is. The next Interestingly, one, okay. at Sinai, uh, they, this is Jewish tradition, but you can figure it out from reading the Bible. The Bible doesn't say directly that um, God spoke his law from Sinai on Pentecost. But the Jewish tradition says that he did. But when you, if you go through the Bible, it says they were journeying so many days, and that they left on um, on Passover. And they journeyed so many days, and you can figure it out. It was about Pentecost time when they arrived at Sinai, so it does indeed fit. So, um, the, God speaking His law from Sinai on Pentecost, um, it shows that Pentecost and His law are very are th those two are tied together. Here's another here's another piece of evidence for that. Do you remember how many people were killed? Three thousand. Do you remember how many people were baptized at Pentecost? Three thousand. Do you think there's that's accident? I don't. That's at Pentecost. So Peter Peter having the sermon and they baptized three thousand. Okay, the next one would be the next one is uh Yes, okay. uh, the towers went down in between um, Trumpets and Day of Atonement, which is called the Ten Days of Awe, which is very interesting timing. But anyway, what Trumpets. what we've that's a, that's getting into a different topic. Um, that's getting the prophetic. Uh, we'll cover that in a minute. But anyway, the next one is a Feast of Trumpets comes in the fall, and the Feast of Trumpets. The whole purpose of that is it's. An announcement, trumpets announce. It's an announcement that you have 10 days till judgment day. In other words, it's God's final last call. Wake up. This is your last call to repent before judgment day. And on judgment day, you're, um, it, when you're judged, you're either judged in or out of the kingdom. It's irrevocable. And that's when you're sealed. And the, your decision has been made as to whether or not you're saved. So... It's, the trumpets are God's last call, wake up, repent. We believe that the trumpets of Revelation are the fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets and that we believe that the trumpets of Revelation are still in the future, all of them. And uh, that's a whole other topic, which we've preached on extensively before and sent out a lot of material via our newsletters on that, proving that point. Um, but anyway, the trumpets are yet future. And in the and sanct and they in the will be they will indeed wake a lot of the world up that um, the end of the world is near. That's why the great multitude is brought in. The hundred four thousand will be mightily preaching during that time, and they will bring in the great multitude spoken of in Revelation. They got woke up because of the trumpets. Okay. The trumpets in this tabernacle are on the curtain. Remember the the um, the angels are are there with the embroidery and the, they've got the trumpets. It's all right there. When you start looking, these feasts are right through the whole sanctuary, and they are telling the same exact story. But then they're giving us the timing of when it is. So it's just a little bit. It's just more detail of what the sanctuary tells us. About his way and when. And then, what are you looking for? Something else. Something else? You ready to hey, move into Day of Atonement? Yes, Day of Atonement is Judgment Day. That's when we're um, sealed. Our 
decision is irrevocable as to whether or not we're saved. And so we definitely all want to be ready for that day. We don't know when the um, when our day when our name will come up in the judgment. So we need to be ready all the time. And in fact, we could one of us could die tonight. And then, I had one of I had one of my so. dear friends in Arkansas was um, playing with the with with their uh, church music group up front, and he keeled over dead right there in front of everybody. You just never know. No, this is long before. This is years ago, and he's. I think Richard was four years older than me. And um, just keeled over dead in front, playing his guitar, doing what he loved to do, serving the Lord. And I can't think of a better, a better thing for him. But it was a shocker for all of his family and for, for friends. But the point is, we don't know when our probation is going to close. So we need to be ready all the time. So, so that's the Day of Atonement message, which is extremely important. Uh, for us, especially of the last generation. And then the final feast is the Feast of Tabernacles. The word tabernacle tells you what it's all about, well, tabernacling just, with God. Just before you get into that, though, where was the, in the sanctuary, where was the Day of Atonement carried out? Where was oh, yes, it? it's we in the most it. holy place. It's in the most holy place. See, each one of these feasts has a place. All right, go ahead with the tabernacles. Yes. Tabernacles. Um, is tabernacling with God. Tabernacle means to dwell with. And Jesus was born at Tabernacles. That's a whole nother long subject, which we don't have time to delve into, but we can show you that um, Jesus was born on the first day of Tabernacles and circumcised on the eighth day of Tabernacles. Which is the last great day. And... Um, Jesus can, is going to, the second coming is going to occur on the first day of tabernacles. There were seven days ascending, and we enter heaven on the eighth day, the last great day of tabernacles. And that's, again, a fascinating topic. But Ellen White tells us that tabernacles is when the wicked will all be burned up. She tells us that in Patriarchs and Prophets, page uh, 540 or 541. Here I can read the quote to you. Yeah, this is this is really really interesting because the the Bible really pinpoints a lot more about the second coming than what we have realized. Here it is, um, Patriarchs and Prophets, page five forty one. The Feast of Tabernacles was not only commemorative, but typical. Commemorative means looking, back. looking backward to remember the things that God did for them in the past on those days, but also typical, meaning pointing forward. In other words, it's prophetic. It not only pointed back to the wilderness sojourn, but as the Feast of Harvest, it celebrated the ingathering of the fruits of the earth and pointed forward to the great day of final ingathering when the Lord of the harvest shall send forth his reapers to gather the tares together in bundles for the fire and to gather the wheat into his garner. At that time... What time is she talking about? Future. Feast of Tabernacles. That's the subject. At that time, the wicked will all be destroyed. So she's saying the wicked will be destroyed at Tabernacles. Well, we know that when the wicked are destroyed, that happens at the second coming, that Jesus says that in Matthew chapter 13. And he says that the, in fact, Matthew chapter 13, in talking about the parable of the wheat and the tares, Jesus says that the... Um, the um, end of the world happens then with the, you know, with the wicked are destroyed. And um, I, well, I, I well, wanna... let's look at, let's look at Matthew 13 really quick. There's some, another point I wanted to make. Um, oh, he says here, Jesus, in explaining this parable of the wheat and the tares, she, he says in verse 39, the harvest is the end of the world. Well, the Feast of Tabernacles is known as the harvest feast because when they had gathered in all their harvest, then they celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles. And so it's the harvest feast, yeah, a joyous time. 
And so Jesus is saying, he's telling us the Feast of Tabernacles is the end of the world. And Ellen White is affirming that in Patriarchs of Provis, where she says that at Tabernacles is when the wicked will all be destroyed. Um, I want to point something else out here, too. It's John chapter 7. And in fact, in my Bible, the title of chapter 7 is Jesus at the Feast of Tabernacles. So the whole chapter is talking about him at the Feast of Tabernacles. And verse 37 says, In the last day, that great day of the feast, which would be the last great day, which is the eighth day, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. We've spiritualized that, which is legitimate. Jesus is the water of life after all, correct? But we are also told that we should take the text literally unless there's a an obvious symbol. What would be the literal fulfillment of this? Why would Jesus be standing on the last great day? Because it, it says, in the last day, the, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood. Well, if we are, if we are, uh, if Jesus comes at the first day of tabernacles, Ellen White says that we are seven days ascending. That would put us entering into heaven on the last great day of the feast, which is the first day we're going to get to drink of the water of life that comes from the throne of God. It's right. It's 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 right there. You know yes. the the prophecies are are so amazing, and they are tied to the feasts, which are not done away with, because they have not been fulfilled according to Matthew five seventeen and eighteen. And then there, there's one other thing I want to throw out here before. Before I forget, before my senior moment catches up here, Jesus is our example in how many things? All. Did Jesus ever participate in the ceremonial law? No, never. But he kept the feasts. If he kept the feasts, but he did not participate in the ceremonial law, then the feasts have to be the moral law. There's no, there's no movement one way or another with that. So if he's our example in all things, shouldn't we be keeping these things? Well, I'll read the quote that goes with it. Ellen White wrote this in the Bible Echo, October 31, 1898. Christ passed through all the experiences of his childhood, youth, and manhood without the observance of ceremonial temple worship. Now, why did he never participate in the ceremonial system? Because he had never sinned. He didn't need an offering for him. The ceremonial so. law was the sacrificial system, and it was you offered a lamb if you had sinned, but he never sinned. If he had participated in that, he would have been saying he was he had sinned. That's why he never did. So that, sh but he kept the feasts, which shows that um, that uh, he did not consider the feast to be part of the ceremonial law. And there's only two laws, Ellen White says, moral and ceremonial. Therefore, the feasts have to be part of the moral law, which makes them then part of the new covenant not the old covenant. They were part of the old covenant, but they're part of the new covenant as well. And, um, Bible echo. Yes, it's Bible echo, October 31, 1898. There's another interesting quote, Advent review and Sabbath Herald, July 7, 1896. She says, Jesus traveled up and down the breadth of the land, giving his invitation to the feast. This was the feast of tabernacles. That's a lot of work. He traveled the whole length of Israel, inviting people to come to the Feast of Tabernacles. If the Feast of Tabernacles was about to end, why would he have bothered with so much effort traveling by foot many miles to invite people to come to the feast? Then she says, he took the opportunity of presenting himself to the people during the feast days when they gathered at Jerusalem. So now, we, we, we've, we've also had... People tell us, well, Jesus didn't always go. You know, there were times that he didn't go. But it was clear that they were ready to kill him. So if you knew that next Sabbath going to church, there's going to be somebody there ready to shoot you, would you go? You'd probably stay away. Does that mean that you are no longer a Sabbath keeper? Of course not. So that, so that argument falls flat on, it, on itself. It's a rope of sand, absolutely.
Okay. While we're on the subject of Jesus keeping the feast, I want to read to you what he said to them at the Last Supper. This is Luke 22, verses 15 and 16. And he, Jesus, said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So Jesus was saying that Passover, is the ultimate fulfillment of it, is not until the kingdom of God. And again, Matthew 5, 17 and 18, until it's fulfilled, it's not abolished. What supper are we going to eat when we get to the kingdom of God? The marriage supper of the Lamb. So the Passover, the ultimate fulfillment, is pointing forward to the marriage supper of the Lamb, which we will celebrate when we get to heaven. Isn't that wonderful? So that's very exciting. Um, but I wanted to show you real quickly um, Proverbs 7. This is how we know that Jesus comes on the first day of tabernacles. It's a very interesting pro prophecy in Proverbs. Proverbs 7, is t the first part of it is talking about an adulteress, a harlot, meaning a young man trying to get him to come to her house. And um, she says in verse 16, I've decked my bed with coverings of tapestry with carved words, with fine linen of Egypt. I've perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves. Then she says something very interesting. For the good man is not at home. He has gone a long journey. He hath taken a bag of money with him and will come home at the day appointed. In the Bible, a uh, woman represents a church, right? So a harlot would represent a church in apostasy. So she's a church in apostasy out there going after other lovers. And she says, because the good men is gone on a long journey. Goodman represents Jesus. He's gone on a long journey to heaven. So the church is saying, well, Jesus is gone for a long time. We don't know when he's coming back. Meanwhile, we're going to have our fun and, um, and apostatize and do our own thing. And um, he hath taken a bag of money with him. In the Bible, remember, God calls his people jewels. Remember when Jesus went to heaven, the Bible says that he, well, when Jesus rose from the grave, a lot of other people were resurrected with him and they went with him to heaven. And they were this bag of money that went to heaven with him. Then this woman, although she's a church in apostasy, does know this much. She says the good man will come home at the day appointed. That word appointed is full moon. Well, we know that um, what we already showed you that the um, the second coming will occur at Tabernacles. But how do we know it's the first day of Tabernacles? Because the first day of Tabernacles is a full moon. That's how we know. And so this is very interesting. Tells us what day of Tabernacles he's coming back. Now we don't know because the feasts move by as much of a month from year to year. We don't know yet. Um, the exact day in our calendar. We just know it's the first day of Tabernacles, but it could be, Tabernacles comes, it can come anywhere from mid-September to mid-October, that month time frame. So we don't know the exact day yet. But that's why the Bible says, calls us to watch and pray, watch and pray, for you know not the hour where to watch and pray. God will eventually reveal it to us. Um, so, yes, yeah. that's right. Oh, yes, we forgot Colossians 2. We're running out of time. Okay, real quick. Colossians 2, this is the big chapter that people say, oh, yes, here is where Paul abolished the, abolished the feast days. And um, now think about it. If Paul is keeping the feast days and teaching them to his gentle converse, clear to the end of his ministry, which we already showed you, is he then going to tell the Philippians one thing and the Colossians that's something totally opposite? No, the Bible says, Malachi chapter 3, I believe, God does not change. God does not change. He's not going to tell one group of people one thing and then another group of people something completely opposite. So we've already showed you from a number of different verses that Paul was keeping the feast days, teaching them to his gentle converse. So to then come along and make a total opposite interpretation of Colossians 2 and says that he abolished them here to the Colossians is violating, it's, making the, it's pitting the Bible against the Bible. 
because uh, it's pitting Paul's words in one part of the Bible against Paul's words again in another part. Anytime we end up with an interpretation where we're pitting, we come, we're pitting the word of God text against each other. Um, we know we have not arrived at truth because God does not change. He does not conflict with himself. So the um, verse 16 is, uh, well, verse 14, it says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. They say, there it is. He nailed the feast days to the cross. Well, it doesn't say feast days there for one thing. It just says ordinances, which means laws. And... Um, and, and uh, it can be interpreted two different ways. When you look up the word blotting, the word blotting gives you a huge tip here. When you work up, look up that word through the entire Bible, which I did, and I also looked at that word through all of Ellen White's writings, which took me hours, and I found out there's only two things blotted out. One is your name is blotted out in the judgment out of the book of life if you're lost. Or in the judgment, your sins are blotted out if you're saved. So there's only two things blotted out. So I believe what this is saying is that um, our sins are going to be blotted out. That the handwriting of ordinances that was against us were our sins. Our sins were against us. And that's what's going to be blotted out. Now, Ellen White also does say that this was talking about the ceremonial law that was blotted out at the at the cross. So you can take it that way as well. It's probably, you can take it both ways. Right, Daniel 9.27. But uh, again, it's not talking about the feast days. But then in verse 16, he does delve into the feast days. He says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day, that's feast days, or the new moon, that's new moon celebration, or the Sabbath days. Now, the word days there is italicized, meaning the translators inserted it. It's not there in the original. So, in other words, Paul is saying, don't let anyone judge you about keeping and observing feast days, the new moon celebration, or the seventh-day Sabbath. That's what he was saying. It's a triad there. It's weekly, monthly, yearly uh, celebration of holy days. And Paul, being an incredible student of the Torah, he's quoting from the Old Testament, and the Old Testament has that same triad, um, the weekly Seventh-day Sabbath, the monthly new moon, and the uh, yearly feast days in a number of places. And if you like, I can rattle them all off to you because I wrote them in my Bible here. It's First Chronicles 23, 31, Second Chronicles 2, 4, Second Chronicles 8, 13, Second Chronicles 31, 3, Nehemiah 10, 33, Hosea 2.11 and Ezekiel 45.17. So all of those places talk about the same triad that Paul is talking about here in Colossians 2.16. Paul's quoting from the Torah and the Old Testament here. And he's saying, don't let anyone judge you on how you keep these days. In other words, if, there, if, if they were done away with... It wouldn't be an issue, they're, would they're, it? You're not going to be judged. This actually shows that they are still in existence and still important because yeah like i say if they're if they're done away he wouldn't be saying don't let anybody judge you on this thing that's already been done away it, it would be it, it would, no it would be a dead issue he wouldn't even bring it up but he's in other words he's they were obviously judging each other as we tend to do oh you know they went swimming on the sabbath oh you know i think they're breaking the sabbath and so this yeah. that kind of judging, I think that was going on. And he was saying, don't judge each other on how you keep these worship days of God. Is what he was saying. And then the next verse is, in talking about all these holy days, he's saying, which are a shadow of things to come. In other words... Is the Sabbath a shadow of something to come? Well, there's a millennial Sabbath. And the Sabbath God has given, um, it's a memorial of creation. It also points forward to recreation. Exactly. So it so, points forward to it. So in other yeah. words, the word shadow really should have been interpreted, written prophecy, which are a prophecy of things to come. And indeed, all of them, that goes into our next subject, which I'll try and spend only oh, five minutes on. Uh, Melody, before, before we finish but, that, though, this very last phrase of 
verse 17 is kind of weird. But the body is of Christ. Has that ever bothered you? You wondered about that? Let, is supplied. The is is supplied. So let's drop that out. But the body of Christ. All right. So let's go back to 16. Let no man therefore judge you in all of these things, which are sad of things to come, but the body of Christ. Amen. They're the ones to judge. And they're the ones to judge based upon what the Torah says, what God says, our design laws. So it is the body of Christ that does. Does that kind of clear that up a little bit? Yeah. So, so in... in um, in, the, in the new book I'm writing, I really delve into this. Um, Crozier was a um, early Advent believer, and he wrote an article in um, in the Daystar Extra that Ellen White said, and this is the only article she ever said this about. She said that God showed her in vision that this article was the truth that Crozier wrote in that day star. That, was, that must have been some mighty, incredible truths for God to speak to Ellen White from heaven and say, this article that Crozier wrote is the truth. Pay attention to it. And so I'm going to read a little bit from that article. He's uh, In that article, he talks about types and what he means by types, his feast days. And um, so I'll, I'll read that, read what he wrote. That some of the legal types have met their anti-types, meaning fulfillment, is beyond controversy. By learning the manner of their fulfillment and the principle as to time by which they are fulfilled, we can the more understandingly proceed to the investigation of the other types. There are two classes of yearly types, the vernal, that's the spring, and the autumnal, that's the fall, Leviticus 23. So he's clearly talking about the spring feast and the fall feast, because he actually says Leviticus 23, spring and fall. The former, that's the spring, met their antitypes at the first advent, but the latter, that's the fall feasts, are to be fulfilled in connection with and after the second advent. The vernal types were the Passover, 14th, first month, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, 15th to 22nd of the first month, waving of the first fruits, 16th first month, and the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost, 50 days after the third month, Leviticus 23, 1 through 21. It is ascertained that the Paschal antitype began at the crucifixion, but where must it end? Let the Savior answer, Luke 22, 15 to 18. And he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So Crozier, in other words, was saying the feast days, yes, the spring, the spring feast days had a fulfillment at the first advent, but even the spring feast days still have yet a future fulfillment that we have not ascertained. And the fall feasts, none of them have received any fulfillment at all. They're all going to be fulfilled in connection with, uh, with events connected with the second advent and beyond the second advent, which is true because um, the Seventh-day Sabbath points forward to the great Sabbath millennium, the seventh millennium, and the... Um, and the um, tabernacles, where we're tabernacling with God, also points forward to the end of the millennium, eight days of tabernacles. I think um, it's on the eighth beginning of the eighth millennium that this world is created anew, and I believe it will be created at tabernacles. The wicked are destroyed two times, right? At the beginning of the millennium, end of the millennium. I believe both times are at the Feast of Tabernacles. And that's the subject of Zechariah 14, which we don't have time to go into. But Zechariah 14 says that the um, that after the wicked are all destroyed, that the righteous will come up from year to year to keep the Feast of Tabernacles forever in the new earth, forever and ever and ever. That's what it's saying in Zechariah chapter 14. Study that chapter out very carefully. And that's what it says. Wow. Yes, I've, I've printed a whole lot of his article in, in my new book. Yes, what I just wrote, read to you is in the old book. It's in this one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, let me see. 
I think it was 1846. It's, uh, yes. Day Star Extra, February 7, 1846. And in fact, you can find Crozier's entire article on the internet. I did, I downloaded it and printed the whole thing off. Well, we have given you all a mouthful and then some. And, and we've uh, only scratched the surface. Right. I'm writing a whole nother book, which I'm hoping to have done this spring, which is going to give you a whole lot more than what we had time for this morning. So. So let's have a prayer. And um, I'm sure some of you are going to have questions and we'll be happy to answer that later. Maybe we can do that on one of these evenings. So let's have, let's have a prayer. Father, we thank you for all of this wonderful truth that you have laid out here in your word. Help us to take it to heart and to be willing to follow where it leads. Please bless us now the rest of this Shabbat. And uh, may we all be ready for you along with our families when you come. In Yeshua's name, amen.